I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I am your host, Jesse Lawler, here with episode number 16 of the podcast where we try to help you maximize the use of your brain through any and all means necessary, including force feeding yourself little pharmaceutical pellets. We're going to be talking with a lawyer today. Yes, a lawyer, not a not a brain researcher, not a biochemist, not any of those types of things that we normally talk with on this show, but somebody that deals with the law. And um, in this case, it's going to be Lawrence G. Walters, an attorney from the state of Florida in the good old U.S. of A. He's going to be telling us about several things, but mostly about online pharmacies and the legalistics of purchasing from them if you're trying to buy something that you may not have an actual prescription for. So uh, yeah, an interesting little legal tap dance there. Definitely some some shady gray areas that we'll be talking about. So um, yeah, you consider this the legal training episode of this podcast. And um, yeah, we might, we might get more back into these questions later. But before we get into all that, I should promise you later in the episode in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, I'm going to tell you about something that I'm doing myself, which is a you know, probably partially inspired by the Sebastian Marshall Quantified Self episode. So yeah, we'll have that be the little gimmick at the end. But for right now, before the interview, let's do This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. Okay, so an interesting article this week from a singularityhub.com. This is about transcranial direct current stimulation, also known as TDCS. For some reason, they do not capitalize the T in transcranial. So if you want to look up TDCS and you're punching that into Google, uh, Google probably won't care. But for some reason, it's a small T, a big DCS. Uh, Transcranial direct current stimulation is the idea that by applying an electric current to somebody's brain, in this case, they were doing it with electrodes on both the head and arm, that you can boost the brain's receptivity to new learning. They've done several studies on this, all of which seem to hint that there really is something going on here, and this isn't just like woo-woo magic stuff. We've got a 2005 study showed that TTCS improved working memory. A 2008 study showed that it improved language learning. And a third study published earlier this year has showed that TTCS delivered to the parietal cortex, which is a part of the brain through which visual information flows, enhanced short-term visual memory compared to a placebo group. So, you know, they're not exactly sure what's going on that's causing these changes. However, they were just looking at the group that they did this latest study on versus a control group. Everybody's got a a baseline level of electromagnetism going on within their brain when, you know, certain stimulus are applied. And so they they measured the baseline of these individuals both before and after the transcranial direct current stimulation. And they found that immediately following an hour-long session, the people that had received the treatment had amplitudes of their magnetic responses in their brain six times greater than their baselines. This dropped to a 2.5-fold boost in amplitude after 50 minutes. So, I mean, it dropped off pretty quickly, I guess, back to baseline levels. But checking to see if there were any lasting anatomical changes, the group then conducted a study using diffusion tensor imaging. They can visualize the white matter fiber tracks connecting different parts of the brain, and that showed clear changes in brain structure only five days following the stimulation of the brain with TDCS. So there's, there seems to be something going on. There's at least one company that is selling to the public a transcranial direct current stimulation piece of headgear, but this has not yet been approved by the U.S. FDA. It is apparently available outside the U.S., and I might see if I can use some evil back channels to get my hands on one of these things so I can uh, further investigate. But anyway, um, yeah, we'll put a link to this article. It was pretty interesting. A little bit of a longer article, but that shouldn't scare you. Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, so with no further ado, let's... uh. I'm I'm curious as to how many of our listeners are, you know, semi-regularly buying things that they might not actually have prescriptions for in the vague and hazy online realm where such things are possible. I know I've done so myself. I'll I'll be the first to admit that. So, um, so yeah, I was definitely very curious about Mr. Walter's answers to a lot of the questions that I posed. So, yeah, let's dive into the interview and see how this goes. So, I am talking with Lawrence G. Walters. You are an attorney who specializes in, among other things, well, I, I guess First Amendment law is part of it, but um, specifically today we're going to be talking about online uh, pharmaceutical companies, which you have as particular expertise in, in helping out these folks. I do, and uh, my, my focus at uh, Walters Law Group is 
on internet law issues in general. And we, we do uh, handle quite a few free speech issues, advertising law issues, and that's kind of how we get into the uh, issues with online pharmacies because they constantly have concerns with the legality of their advertising as well as the legality of their underlying product services. So we've developed an expertise in that area as well. That's an interesting question right off the bat there. So can you tell me a little about the differences between the underlying legality of the services they're providing versus uh, you know, what would be involved in, in the advertising of it? Like why those are two different sort of subcategories? Well, the simple answer is the First Amendment. In the United States, advertising is treated differently from a legal standpoint than activity uh, that is separate from the advertising. So in other words, an ad might be protected speech and enjoy certain levels of constitutional protection and be insulated from government regulation as compared to activity. So, you know, an example that has come up at the U.S. Supreme Court is gambling advertising. And the Supreme Court has said that um, even if gambling advertising and the underlying gambling activity might be illegal in one state, um, so long as the, the underlying activity is legal in the state where it's coming from, the gambling advertisement is legal in any state. So there is a, a higher level of protection afforded to advertising activity as a form of commercial speech um, than the underlying uh, product or services being sold. And that's it's an important distinction. You know, we have a right to talk about things, even if we don't have the right to to do those things. That's really interesting. So, and I guess with the internet, since it's inherently international, uh, does it stand to reason that if something is legal somewhere, then uh, it can be advertised essentially anywhere online? You know, let's take a, a ludicrous example and say, you know, there's some country where murder is legal. So I could advertise my services as a, as a hitman online anywhere? Taken to its logical extreme, that could be the ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court. Essentially, what the court has said is that if the underlying activity is legal in the state uh, or jurisdiction where it's coming from, then the advertising is legal anywhere that it's disseminated. And you know, some of these issues have come up again in the online gambling advertising context where you have licensed online gambling facilities in Antigua or Curacao or, or someplace and they want to advertise online, and naturally all internet communications can be received by all countries unless they're blocked. And you know, so U.S. advertisements, U.S. players can receive these ads from foreign licensed online gambling establishments. And so there's a, a real question as to whether or not those ads are legal in the United States or whether they can be somehow criminalized. And that's, it's a brewing issue. It's not one that has been decided by the courts. Ultimately, it will be because there's there's a lot of money at stake and the U.S. market is prized for gambling. And, and so, you know, there, there is an issue there as to whether or not the legality of the advertisement um, it will be treated differently from the legality of the services being advertised. Most of the audience that we have listening is English speaking and probably a healthy majority of us are Americans. You know, th there's a lot of people in America that are wondering if I buy something from an overseas pharmacy, like I think Canadian pharmacies typically will sell modafinil to American citizens who should have a prescription, but don't. Is the buyer doing something illegal? Is the seller doing something illegal? Is, has it been decided? Like what, what sort of nebulous gray area are we in? The short answer is that in most states, it's not nebulous at all. And in fact, there are fairly clear laws that prohibit the possession or importation or transfer of medicines that are prescription only without a prescription. And in Florida, for example, where I'm licensed to practice, uh, we have a statute which prohibits the possession of any prescription drug without the prescription having been issued. There's even a, a statute that prohibits carrying around prescription drugs in any bottle or container that is not the original prescription container. You can imagine that that's probably violated quite often by many people, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, if you're arrested for one thing, they add on another charge because you're carrying around some prescription medicine in some container that's not the original bottle. These are not nebulous gray areas at all. These are serious crimes. The level of severity can vary from state to state, but virtually every state of which I'm aware has some sort of prohibition on the possession of prescription drugs without a prescription. Now, that being said, you know, there are obviously enforcement priorities. 
with both the states and the Department of Justice, the DEA, and FDA. And we haven't seen an all-out assault on individuals who happen to be possessing prescription drugs that have been obtained through the mail or internet pharmacies, et cetera. Uh, we certainly see prosecutions against the pharmacies and the people selling those prescriptions. We see uh, customs enforcement at the border uh, seizing unlawful prescriptions coming into the United States. But the average consumer, while they are likely violating the state law in, in whatever state they happen to be residing, we haven't seen the enforcement level that would really present a, a significant concern to the average individual ordering online. Now, one caveat to that is that there's, there's a, a significant difference between prescription drugs and scheduled controlled substances. The scheduled controlled substances being things like narcotics. And to the, to the extent that you are importing or possessing uh, narcotics scheduled drugs, we do see people you know, regularly arrested and prosecuted for prescription scheduled drug possession as compared to prescription only drugs that are not on a controlled substance schedule. Okay, so could you give me an example of what a scheduled prescription drug would be? Because when I think scheduled, I think things like, you know, cocaine or heroin or something like that, but apparently there's more to it. There is. Yeah, cocaine and heroin would be Schedule One drugs, which means that they have no valid medical use. And, you know, marijuana is on that in most states as well. So, you know, those are, are drugs that cannot be possessed even with a prescription because no valid prescription could be issued. And then there's Schedule II drugs, such as oxycodone, which is a significant concern in, in many states, including Florida, where you have a lot of pill mills you know, cranking out prescriptions for oxycodone. And that is a possession of, of that type of drug can be a, a felony in most states um, if you do not have a valid prescription or if you have a fraudulent prescription. And uh, then you have Schedule Three drugs, which is the kind of the less powerful narcotics and some of the amphetamines. Hydrocodone, for example, would be a Schedule Three drug. And so there's there's various levels of severity in connection with possession and sale of these various different scheduled controlled substances. That's where the DEA comes in. That's where we see a lot of law enforcement with regard to both possession and importation of those types of drugs. When it comes to prescription only drugs, we you know we haven't seen a significant level of enforcement. It's more of a health concern. This is kind of where the FDA comes in as opposed to the DEA. The Food and Drug Administration takes a more active role when you talk about prescription only drugs and their distribution without a prescription. And the effort is directed towards trying to prevent the importation, trying to identify the offenders before they send something to the United States and, and block it uh, either at customs or uh, using uh, enforcement mechanisms in other countries, et cetera. But once the drugs get into the United States and, and they're in the hands of an individual, it's frankly unlikely that they will be prosecuted, but certainly not impossible. We do see circumstances where, like I say, somebody is comes to the attention of law enforcement for some other reason. And you know they get a DUI or they violate their probation or some other issue, and then they find the prescription only drugs without a prescription, and it's just another charge that can be added on and be problematic for the consumer. Gotcha. In your experience, have you seen that happen of, um, you know, where somebody might be busted for, you know, I guess what we would consider sort of a legitimate crime and something like, oh, by the way, you also shopped at this online pharmacy from Canada was one of the uh, additional things thrown at them. You know, is that happening in practice in the real world? Yes, I, I have personally seen uh, additional charges added on for possession of prescription-only drugs without a valid prescription once somebody's arrested for some other type of crime. Has there ever been, to your knowledge, I, I guess, you know, if you're not carrying necessarily the prescription drugs on your person, but it would be pretty easy, for example, to between looking up IP addresses and things like that to say, hey, Joe the American purchased something that he didn't have a prescription from an online pharmacy. Whether or not he's got that on his person at the time of an arrest, is that something where, um, you know, sort of looking through the internet trace route stuff and, and seeing that a purchase was made by a person, has that sort of evidence been used, to your knowledge? Well, I can tell you that investigative techniques at the, uh, at the federal level are, are fairly advanced. The state level, less advanced, but they're getting better at investigating internet oriented crime. And it is still a challenge for law enforcement to put somebody behind the keyboard, so to speak. You, you can get IP addresses, you can, you know, identify maybe even a household 
where a computer was used to order prescription drugs or commit some other kind of crime. But identifying the person that actually engaged in that activity within the household, especially if there's multiple people, can, can be problematic. And it's, um, it's the kind of thing where you know, circumstantial evidence is introduced. Sometimes there's confessions that can sink somebody um, if they're arrested and they, you know, they, they give up the goods. Yeah, it was me. But absent that, it can be very difficult for law enforcement to identify who is engaged in any activity behind a keyboard. And we run into this oftentimes with copyright enforcement cases. I, I both prosecute and defend copyright infringement cases. And, you know, when I'm defending somebody alleged to have downloaded an illegal copy of a movie or a song or something, you know, one of the first things that we insist upon is some kind of real proof that the person who you're associating with this IP address really engaged in the activity. And that's where a lot of these copyright cases tend to fall apart. Well, I guess one of the things that uh, is certainly uh, I was going to ask, but you've probably sort of answered this in a roundabout way already is, you know, why there's so many online pharmacies that seem to really conceal who the real people behind them are and seem a little bit like fly by night operations that, you know, they're, they're online one day and then they're gone the next. And people oftentimes have, uh, I've, I've been getting an increasing amount of email from listeners who are asking, oh, you know, where should I try to buy this, that, or the other thing? And, and you know, I haven't really put together any sort of you know, list of recommended suppliers of anything yet. But it is just, it's obviously a very fluid industry where online shops will appear and disappear and change names and things like that. And, and the buying procedures aren't, are not at all uh, quite as simple as just, you know, click here to pay with PayPal a lot of the time. Do you have any, anything you'd like to riff on there as far as sort of anecdotal stories that you've come across in online pharmacies? Just to your point of the, the anonymity and the fly-by-night nature of the industry, that's the case with, with any gray area industry. And where you have an industry that is focused on providing prescription drugs to U.S. citizens without a prescription, they're obviously engaging in illegal activity from a U.S. law perspective. Now, what the law is in the Ukraine or wherever they're, they happen to be located is another matter. And, and usually there is no law or it's not enforced, or you know, they've greased the right palms and there's no problem in their host jurisdiction. So they don't have a problem with being concerned about being prosecuted in their host jurisdiction, but it's a matter of the U.S. trying to stay one step ahead of these internet pharmacies and you know, blocking IP addresses or going to the hosts that might be providing services or the billing processors and trying to cut them off um, at every turn to try to make doing business more difficult. And that's why they have to keep reinventing themselves and rebranding themselves as, you know, a, a new company. It's usually the same group uh, or groups that, that put together new sites all the time because, you know, they get found out. They start to get some heat. Um, their services are getting cut off. Their, you know, Visa MasterCard's caught on to what they're doing. And so then they have to form a new corporation, form a new website, pop up in another place. It's, it's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole from the U.S. enforcement perspective. You know, that's the nature of the beast with any of these gray area industries. And it's very difficult for law enforcement to ultimately get a handle on. But, you know, they, they do what they can. And, you know, the Internet tends to route around any of these enforcement methods. And uh, it's been you know, quite successful in doing so. Let me ask you this. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, the, the, the good people at the Food and Drug Administration probably you know have, have the best of intentions for, you know, consumers at heart and, and are just trying to keep people from getting access to medicines which might not be correct or healthy for them. And, you know, wh wh whether they make those decisions, you know, rightly or wrongly is anybody's ballgame. But my question would be this. Have there been instances that you know about where somebody might have bought a pharmaceutical from an online pharmacy and really not gotten the pharmaceutical that they thought they were getting, where it's, it's not just a question of that they shouldn't have had it, but that they really didn't get what they ordered is not the right thing? Like, is that something you see occurring? Yes, I both know of instances like that and have read about them. And it's not surprising to be sure because of the unregulated nature of simply sending packages over the mail uh, without any kind of inspection, without any kind of quality control at the initiating end. This is a, a, an area that's primed for abuse. And if a internet pharmacy can charge top dollar for something they claim to be a brand name drug or a, a generic drug, and yet you know, give you a low quality substitute or a fake substitute and increase their profit margin by you know, 500%, there's a tremendous incentive from a greed perspective to do that. And so we do see that happen, particularly given what we talked about 
just previously about the anonymity factor. You know, if these companies only plan to be in business for a few weeks, maximize their profit, bang out a bunch of orders, and then disappear and reinvent themselves as some new company with a new website and new URL, they don't care about what they're sending oftentimes. Now, you know, is this a common thing? I don't know. I, you know, I, I tend to, to think in my experience and in, in representing online pharmacies and representing people who are, have been caught up in issues with them, fake drugs it has not been a significant issue. Uh, typically, the, the drugs are real. Uh, they might not be the highest quality. They might be a generic when they're supposed to be a brand or something. But you know, the, the drugs are real and the companies, to an extent, on reorders from existing comp- customers. So, you know, if you get a fake drug, you're obviously not going to reorder and you're going to tell all your friends that this is a bad place to do business with. So, you know, the ones that want to establish some degree of credibility and establish a customer relationship can't do that. So I think it's a small percentage of the problem, but it, it does exist. So we use the F word, which is felony. This is definitely, um, you know, for somebody possessing drugs that they're not supposed to have on their person. They could be a felony, even if it seems like it's something that's an innocuous prescription drug. shouldn't be anything that you're necessarily going to be going to jail for. But I mean, what what is the worst case scenario? Like, I know that the examples you've used have typically been, you know, if somebody's arrested for one thing that this would sort of be a tacked on charge of, oh, by the way, they also had some drugs that they shouldn't have had on their person. But in a case where really this was the only thing that they had done, you're, you're caught with some modafinil that you shouldn't have had or some Adderall you shouldn't have had, you know, in your pocket. What could you conceivably be looking at as a U.S. citizen? I know it's going to vary state by state. I'll give you examples from Florida law. And, uh, to the, and, you know, this, the states tend to be fairly similar. I mean, there's, there's variations in policy and drug enforcement and so forth. But, you know, a, a common theme is that we see uh, controlled substances treated differently from prescription-only substances. And we see large quantities treated differently from small quantities. And there are presumptions that come into play when an individual possesses a certain amount of a particular drug, the federal system is different in terms of the quantities that will trigger harsher penalties. But we will often see possession of a a personal amount of a prescription drug to be a misdemeanor, whereas possession of several prescriptions or more than you would need in a month, let's say, to trigger intent to sell or a presumption that you intended to sell the drug even if you have, if there's no evidence that you are selling. And that's where, you know, people can, can get into trouble and serious trouble is if they order a lot of a particular drug because they don't want to engage in multiple orders. And even if it's th- for their own personal use, you know, if they have three or six months worth on hand, they could be triggered that they fall into this presumption of intent to sell and end up with a, a pretty significant felony charge. Let's see. What about, uh, for example, if you go down to Mexico, you can go into a pharmacy and buy all kinds of stuff over the counter with just cash that you know is, is normally prescription only in the states. Um, what is the legality there as far as uh, you know, citizens of one country? If you're outside of your home country and you do a drug which would not necessarily have been legal in your home country, is it kind of all's fair as long as you're off the the local turf where the laws enforced, or is there anything that follows you just by virtue of being a citizen? The bottom line is that typically U.S. law cannot be enforced against individuals outside of the country for things they're doing outside of the country, so long as there is no impact on the United States. So, you know, somebody going to Mexico and buying and taking drugs in Mexico and then coming home, the United States is not going to have a sufficient interest and ability to enforce its laws against that individual. There's constant negotiations between countries and efforts to try to clamp down on drug abuse and so forth. But from a purely legal perspective, that individual wouldn't be violating U.S. law. There are some exceptions when it comes to things like sex tourism, for example. An individual you know, might go to Thailand and uh, you know, try to engage in sexual activity with minors in that jurisdiction. The United States has an interest in preventing that sort of activity, even though it's occurring overseas. And there are sex tourism laws that will allow the United States government to punish United States citizens that engage in that activity, even if it's overseas. You know, that's the distinction. But, you know, pure drug possession and use in a foreign country uh, would not subject an individual to prosecution under U.S. law.
Cool. Good information. Well, th that's sort of all the questions that I had off the top of my head, but there might be some things that you want to circle back to or other things that I should have known to ask but didn't that might be relevant to uh, our listeners. I guess just you know, words of, of caution. We see a lot of good people caught up in law enforcement and drug enforcement actions that end up with a, a scourge, a rap sheet, a criminal conviction and end up, frankly, ruining their lives. And, you know, we've seen it over and over again with individuals that, you know, might make a mistake and end up, like I said, with a DUI or some sort of minor offense. And that leads to a search and that leads to finding other things. You know, the cop doesn't like you that day. He's having a bad day. You mouthed off. You know, something happened to escalate the situation. So law enforcement you know, tries to find anything they can to get back at you, to ruin your life, to make things more difficult on you in the legal system. You know, possessing drugs without a prescription is one of those things. It's an Achilles heel that you will subject yourself to if you interact with law enforcement in any way. And you never know when it's going to happen. It's always out of the blue. Even the most careful citizen can get caught up in, in a problem or an interaction with law enforcement that leads to some sort of search. So I would, I would caution anybody to, if at all possible, obtain a prescription before possessing any of these, these drugs and to carry evidence of that prescription with them if they carry the drugs on them. Because we've also seen people arrested for you know, possessing drugs without evidence of the prescription or without the prescription bottle. And that can be problematic even if you ultimately win or if the charges are ultimately dismissed. You know, you, you don't want to be on the front page of the paper uh, having been arrested for prescription drug crime and then, you know, six months later, you get a dismissal and you know, nobody hears about that. But they all remember that you were arrested and the, the legal fees to somebody like me. So, you know, I don't I don't need the business that bad. I, I'd rather people be careful and avoid these kinds of life ruining concerns in, in the future. But you know, secondly, you know, know who you're doing business with. If, if you are inclined to uh, identify a U.S., uh, I'm sorry, a foreign pharmacy and import these things to the United States, I would first ward against it um, because of the, the concerns from a legal perspective. But if, if you are going to do it, you know, do some background research, do some due diligence, and you know, make sure you're dealing with, with somebody that other people have positively reviewed and identified as a credible and viable source uh, so you don't end up poisoning yourself or getting ripped off. We'll be putting up a link to your website so anybody that has any uh, specifically relevant questions can direct them to you. And yeah, just re really good information. Really appreciate the perspective on this stuff. Thank you very much to Lawrence G. Walters for all the information there. Obviously not what all of us necessarily want to hear who are listening to this podcast because you know, sometimes it would be nice to have a little bit more authority over your own medicine cabinet and not have uh, Uncle Sam or whoever the international equivalent of Uncle Sam is poking his nose into uh, to your stuff. But eh, it is what it is. So take all that uh, you know, under advisement when you're making decisions about what you are going to do with your own medicine cabinet. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless listener retention gimmick. Moving right along, as promised in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, I'm going to tell you something that, that I've been doing for, I guess, today is day eight for me. Today's Monday as I record this, and actually, you're, I'm recording this a while before you guys will hear it, but I guess eight days ago or so, Saturday of last week, I woke up and I still felt tired when I woke up. I had some friends coming over for a brunch, had to get up for it and blah, 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 but I was just, my ass was dragging. I did not feel mentally sharp. I did not feel physically, you know, lively, and I didn't feel like I was getting sick. I was just, I was just kind of exhausted. I realized I've, I've just been cutting back on my own sleep a bit too much for a bit too long, and Part of the problem with that is I, I live in a pretty high apartment complex with without a lot of curtains. And so when the sun comes up, I'm kind of like, uh, you know, just blasted with sun rays at like 5.30 or 6 in the morning. It kind of makes it hard to sleep through that, even, even with a sleep mask. It's like those things, they don't have full perfect suction seal on my eyes. So anyway, um, I, I was kind of having a, you know, forced 6 a.m. wake up call every day, but I was still trying to push through and go till, you know, midnight or one o'clock most nights, which is kind of my, my default behavior. But too much of that is is definitely was not proving to be a good thing for me. Too many nights of, you know, bordering between five or six hours of sleep with, you know, maybe a short nap at some point during the day. 
So waking up on Saturday of last week and just feeling like ass, I was like, okay, something something needs to be done here. And I'm going to finally take the advice of all these people that have been on the show and been saying sleep, 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 and actually uh, try to apply that in my own life. So I decided I would do two weeks where I'm, I'm mandating a 10 p.m. bedtime for myself and, and eight hours of sleep. And there have been a couple times since I started that I've gone a little bit past 10 p.m. as far as bedtime, but I've, I've made up for it by sleeping in a little past 6 a.m. on, on the, um, the subsequent mornings. And Really, within just a couple of days, I really did start feeling you know, a, a major difference that was pretty obvious to me in the second half of the day. Mornings are, are pretty much unchanged. I was never having any problems with alertness and livelihood and all that stuff in the mornings. But I was definitely, I think, during my, my more sleep-deprived period, I was feeling like I needed to be propping myself up with caffeine or something like that in the afternoons by about you know 3 or 4 o'clock, sort of that, you know, you eat lunch and you start feeling a little bit of a digestion tiredness. And I never really shook off, you know, that, that feeling of lethargy, at least mentally, during the second half of my days. And that's that really went away after I started reinstituting this eight hours of sleep policy. I felt very sharp pretty much up until the time that I go to bed as I'm sort of starting to, you know, wind down about 8.30 or 9 o'clock most nights, spend like, you know, an hour or two doing doing nothing of real mental substance before going to bed at about 10 o'clock. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say this is a quantified self thing because I'm, I'm not ticking any little measurement boxes on exactly how I feel on any given day, but, uh, you know, probably boneheadedly obvious sleeping more makes you more awake. So uh, anyway, for, for those of you that might be on the sleep deprivation tip like I was, just know that there, there are gains to be had by getting more sleep. And, you know, although I haven't done anything to really chart my hour by hour productivity, Sebastian Marshall style, I can only assume that the quality of the work that I'm doing in the second half of my days is probably more than improved enough to make up for the lack of total hours that I'm putting in versus when I um, was staying up till midnight or one. So anyway, a uh, little anecdote from my own life. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title twice. All right. So that is all of episode 16. I cannot tell you with authority who will be the interview guest or what the topic of conversation will be on episode 17 because I just don't know yet. Um, however, as, as the time draws closer, I will certainly know. And although I'll be the first to know, you'll be the second to know. So stay tuned. We'll have something coming at you next week, equally entertaining and educational. Uh, if you have any thoughts, comments, whatever, about the stuff in this episode, please feel free to drop me a note at jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com or visit the website www.smartdrugsmarts.com where we will have show notes for everything mentioned in this week's podcast and all the usual gadgets and gadgets and widgets. And if you were particularly fond of this week's episode, please feel free to leave a positive review on iTunes, which would be greatly appreciated and help fellow listeners of all things iTunes find out about this podcast and perhaps enable their own brains to further heights of productivity and stimulus and alertness and all that stuff. Other than that, I will see you next week. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.